Well, good morning. Welcome to Alpine Bible Church's live stream. Uh, it's good to have you joining us from wherever you're at to worship with us this morning. Uh, you know, the, every week that we've done this, I and many of us have, have said over and over again, we just continue to anticipate the time when we can get back to some kind of normal uh, and actually look at all of you sitting here with us. But until that time, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather, even in this way. I wanted to say that as we anticipate that, as we look forward to the time of gathering together in person, I hope that this time has made you hungry for that. I hope that this time has made you see, as nice as this is, this is deficient. Uh, to stare at a screen and not be with God's people. And so if nothing else, God may be among uh, 10,000 other things using this for us to just be reminded once again of the importance of the gathering of God's church uh, physically and uh, how important that is. So as we consider that and uh, think about the days to come, I just want to go over a few announcements with you. Uh, they're a bit repetitive because they're kind of the same things, but I just want to remind you uh, about how to stay connected uh, to us as we walk through these days together. We have continued to try to communicate more than we normally do on social media uh, through our Facebook page, our Twitter page, those kinds of things, just to stay uh, connected with you to let you know what's going on, what we're doing, those kinds of things. So do be connected to that. You're obviously connected to our YouTube channel, so continue to uh, stay connected in that way. As we approach, I'm sure you've been watching the news and seeing uh, what's going to happen and what's going to change and the end of the month, all those kinds of questions. As we approach any kind of change in terms of uh, coming back to regular services or whatever, we will communicate those things very clearly with you uh, through social media, through our uh, church email list, those kinds of things. So just stay tuned to that, and we will let you know. We'll make the same kinds of decisions as we've been making in trying to think about what's best uh, to do and uh, all of that. Giving, uh, as, as we have said the last several weeks, uh, we just give God praise for his provision for the, the, our church, for all of uh, the, the congregation, uh, for our missionaries. Uh, just God has been very gracious. But just want to remind you uh, about giving that is available through our website, alpinebible.org giving, or you can go up to the top right hand of the page and you can find it that way. Or many of you have just mailed in your offerings. We give praise for that and uh, are thankful for the Lord's provision in this time. Continue to lift up one another in prayer. It's really important that we remember that, that we are not only just uh, praying that the Lord would bring this to an end, which we should pray for that, not only praying for those who are suffering and are ill, but also just praying for one another as we're not seeing one another face to face, as we're not having the 500 little interactions that we have here in the mornings and on Wednesday nights and throughout uh, the week. Continue to be in prayer for one another because this is doing a lot of things in a lot of people's hearts and lives that we are uh, maybe not aware of. And so be in prayer for one another. It's so great to hear about the way that that has been happening. And I know many of you are, but I just want to encourage you to continue in that. Uh, tonight, uh, the youth will be having their service at 6 o'clock. So uh, students, you can tune into that. You've already heard about that from Pastor David, but just want to remind you about that as well. All right, I want to open us with just a reading from Scripture, and uh, Pastor Byron is going to be in Acts talking about really the formation of the Thessalonian church. And so we're going to hear just Paul's uh, prayer, his encouragement, his admonition to these believers, and it brings such color when we hear what Paul says here, and then we'll, we'll soon hear about how that church began uh, and so just listen to these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, 
because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. What a contrast. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Amen. This is God's word. I'm going to pray, and I would ask that you would join me in prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time together uh, in song and in uh, his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we once again are thankful for a time of gathering around your word, sitting underneath the authority of your word as we really sing your word. We've, we've heard uh, a reading from it now. Now we're praying in response to it. We're going to sing truths from your word. We're going to hear the proclamation of your word. Lord, may we be a people, even in this time, of your word. Thank you that uh, you have saw fit to maintain the ministry of the word and of prayer. That has not been taken away from us. How gracious you are to continue to give that to us and to allow us to be stirred and affected and encouraged and perhaps even rebuked by your word. I pray for the congregation of Alpine, Lord, that are scattered at this point, not together in this room. I pray that you would meet needs. I pray that you would encourage hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would stir us up to love and affection, not only for you, Lord Jesus, but also for one another. I pray, Lord, that you would call us away from despair, call us away from hopelessness, call us away from sin and perhaps uh, lethargy, things that are pulling us away from you. Lord, call us back away from those things and call us to you once again. Uh, Lord, this morning, we just give you praise for who you are. We give you praise for your faithfulness, your uh, great wisdom. Lord, there are so many things that you are doing in and through us and so many of your people throughout the world. You're bringing people to faith in this time. Lord, we, are, we, we stand in awe of you in the midst of such a time of turmoil and confusion because you are not confused and afraid and worried. You are sovereignly upholding the universe by the word of your power. All things are within your hands, including us. And in that thought, Lord, we are humbled and thankful. Lord, I pray that we would be able to sing and encourage one another, even now sitting in our homes. And just uh, as Joel often reminds us, Lord, the encouragement of singing uh, to one another is uh, an important ministry, and may we not forget that in our own families, in our own homes. I pray that uh, you would be with Pastor Byron as he preaches. Lord, may your spirit guide his words. May your spirit guide our ears, and uh, may Jesus Christ be lifted high above all other names. Thank you for all that you give us, Lord. You continue to provide for us as people, as a church, for our missionaries, for so many things, and we give you praise for that. We continue now, Lord, in worship and ask that you would bless our time. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us so well. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Men and women, I hope and pray that that song encourages your hearts, especially in these times when we aren't connected the way that we normally would find ourselves connected. Maybe in your isolation, maybe you begin to find yourself in fear, in anxiety, doubt even, as to the truths and the realities of God's Word the truth of your position in Christ. And I love that song, for you are who he says you are, and that is a child of the living God. I'd like to read a very familiar passage. In fact, I've, I've incorporated it into our time of singing many, many times. But in light of the song that we have just finished, and in light of the song that we're going to sing next, I think it's uh, applicable, but also in light of just the reality that we celebrated even last week, and it is the reality that truthfully sets the Christian apart, the Christ follower, and that is is that our God, our Savior, our Lord is risen, and He is alive. And He is at the right hand of the Father, the Scripture tells us. And He is now making intercession for each one of us. He is not in the grave. He is not just a historical figure that was, but in fact, He is. And men and women, I hope and pray that you find encouragement. As you remember, as we read last week, That when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, at that moment, your identity becomes Jesus before the Father. He is perfect. He is holy. He is just. He cannot have a relationship with you apart from the perfection of His Son, whom He willingly gave and who obeyed and willingly offered himself as the perfect payment, the perfect sacrifice for you and I. But again, that is not the end. He overcame sin and death and rose again. And it is our belief in that, that he rose again and is now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession, saying, he's mine, she's mine. I paid for him. I paid for her. That's the beauty of the gospel. It's the free gift of having a right standing relationship with Almighty God. I'd like to read what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and just remind you that you are not who you were before Christ. Listen to these words. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. Pastor Nick mentioned this just a few minutes ago, that I often remind us of these words. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And don't ever forget, for our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Men and women, we are a new creation. 
only through and in Christ. But the power is in the fact that He rose again. And I don't want to be confusing this morning, and I don't want to say something that I'm not able to clearly explain, but for the sake of time and just trying to be prudent, eternal life and the resurrection is not just an idea that that maybe someday we'll have. But in fact, if you think about the truths of Scripture and, and who we are in Christ, As a child of God, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ in me. And the life I now live, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So I have indeed risen. I I am a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things are new through Christ in me. And yes, there will come a day when physically my life ends. But even that is not the end for me. I don't fear that. And you also, as a child of God, we have nothing to fear. Not even death, because He overcame sin and death. And there will be a glorious day when all of us, every saint, every tribe, every nation, When he says, this is the day, we will rise once more. We will be in his presence. We will lay our crowns down and we will worship him for all eternity. And I don't know about you, but I cannot wait. As Paul said, I'm hard pressed between the two. I love my family. I love my life. But I can't wait to be with my God forever and be rid of viruses and recessions and grief. And so men and women, we hope and pray that again, our times of of prayer, our times of study, and our times of song bring encouragement, bring reminders to you of the truth of God's Word, that you are who He says you are. And that one day we will rise and be with him for all eternity. We're going to sing this last song. I'm going to introduce the song. um, And then we will go right back and, and sing it together collectively. So again, turn this into a time of prayer, a time of worship, and a time of praise to our Heavenly Father. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will rise When He calls my name No more sorrow, no more pain I will
Amen. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. First of all, a shout out to Lily and all the other kids who think that we're not real. We are real. And uh, just that might help you a little bit. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts again, chapter 17. Uh, we left off uh, a few weeks back on uh, Paul and Silas being in prison in Philippi. They were, uh, as you know, beaten. They were locked, uh, put in stocks with their feet, uh, held in the inner prison cell. Uh, they, uh, you know, they uh, expressed praise and worship, praying during that time. It was an amazing thing that had an impact on the prisoners. There was an earthquake. Uh, as a result, uh, their, all their chains fell loose. The, the prisoners could have ran away, but they chose not to. They stayed with Paul and Silas. And as a result of that, the jailer uh, was uh, amazed by that, gave his life to Christ and his whole household. So a great story that had all kinds of uh, emotional ups and downs. And uh, as they left Philippi, we pick up the story at verse uh, 1 of chapter 17 as they press on ahead now on their journey. It says, Now when they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and uh, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So they've left the area, and we uh, automatically read something uh, unique here, which is the pronoun they. They came uh, to Thessalonica, and we realize that uh, Luke who is the, who's the writer of the book of Acts, uh, has now obviously left the team because he's writing back in the third person once again, not including himself, and so he must have stayed in Philippi. We don't know exactly why, uh, if it was to stay and strengthen the church or if he had other business. Uh, we do know that he had an impact staying with the church and so on, but uh, that's all we know. Uh, so they're without a Luke now as he writes, and uh, it says, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. So uh, we know this, that they've left Philippi. They've gone through uh, geographically two cities, Amphipolis and Apollonia, to get to Thessalonica. And uh, in the story, they've gone right into the synagogue, which is uh, the pattern that Paul generally tries to establish and uh, in, in doing so, they uh, have this encounter in the synagogue where it says Paul tells us exactly what Paul did. Three uh, Sabbaths in a row, he reasoned with them uh, from the scriptures. It's always the issue of the scriptures, nothing else. Explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying, this Jesus whom I preached to you is the Christ. Now, uh, we do know that certain uh, passages from the Old Testament uh, saw, or Paul would have been using in this uh, engagement with the synagogue uh, to help explain Jesus. Uh, I'm sure these were common texts that he would have used every time he had a chance to speak in a synagogue uh, to help the Jews understand the connection between the Old Testament, the prophecies about the Messiah and about the Christ uh, who would die on the cross, and to uh, realize that that was Jesus. Uh, as an example, he would have used uh, uh, a reading from Psalm chapter 2. The, it's a messianic psalm, and uh, we read things such as this. I have set my king on my holy hill. Uh, the Lord has said to me, you, you are my son. Uh, some declarations that are made in that particular psalm that would have been recognized as messianic. Also in Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, uh, he, uh, Paul would have brought this up. You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption, or we could say to see decay, uh, which is an, a curious uh, uh, statement to make, uh, even in the Old Testament, that obviously, uh, if that's the case, does that mean the Messiah was going to die? I mean, there would certainly be an allusion to the resurrection. Uh, in Psalm 22, he would have used that text to uh, prophesy many phrases about the crucifixion itself. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 9, a familiar text to many folks uh, at verse 6 and 7, he would have uh, certainly used that text to, to uh, state this. Uh, I'll read this for you. For unto us a son is born, 
Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful and Counselor and Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. Uh, he would have gone on to say, uh, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And uh, so certainly that truth has always been known as, uh, as the sense of the Messiah uh, ruling and reigning and so on. But then he also would have read from uh, Isaiah uh, chapter uh, 11. Uh, he would have addressed that in verse, the few, first few verses. It says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Uh, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Uh, down in verse 4, uh, he, was, uh, he would have used this statement, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Uh, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. And then he would have at least read verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. So these are truths he would have uh, again addressed about this one who's going to come through the very uh, line of, of David, the Davidic king. And then obviously uh, uh, understanding that this one, again, is, uh, has the Spirit of God on him in such an unusual way. The, the fact that he's coming as a judge. Uh, so all these things would certainly speak to the fact that the Messiah would come through David. But then he would also uh, address Isaiah chapter 53 and talk about, uh, again, the descriptions of this Lamb of God who would come to take the sins away of the world, who would uh, have his, uh, his, his body uh, so... Uh, marred uh, that it would be uh, almost impossible to recognize him, uh, that this would take place and that this would please God to have this uh, uh, person uh, take the sins of the world upon himself. And then he certainly would include uh, the text in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, which expresses the, the birthplace of Jesus. Uh, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So this description of the one who comes not only from the uh, line of David as king, but then is also born in Bethlehem, this one who is also eternal. And so he says, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Well, uh, some Jews obviously would respond positively. We're told back in our, in our text uh, that in verse 4, and some of them were persuaded. Some of these Jews were persuaded. Before I press on in the text, I want to just uh, take a sideline here for just a moment. Uh, two notations that I want us to understand. The first is this. I want to talk about Paul's approach in sharing the gospel. We know in Philippi and now here in Thessalonica, Paul and the team were not preaching the gospel on street corners. I'm not against that, but it's uh, something we learn from Paul that is, for him certainly, and his situation, not the best method, and would likely ha would have had less results. Paul's approach is always to establish some kind of common ground. And so uh, let me just review for a moment. As a Jew attending the synagogue, Paul, uh, also being a visitor and a former Pharisee, it always gave him an opportunity to speak in the synagogue. He was welcome. That was uh, something that was a, a common thing to do. If someone was uh, a stranger who uh, was a professing uh, follower of God, but in this case also his credentials gave him a, a voice. Uh, also, back in Philippi, where there was no synagogue, uh, Paul had found out that there were some God-seeking women who were meeting by a stream outside of town, and he met with them, and as a result, a church was started in Philippi. You recall, again, as we already mentioned, that you know, just expressing praise uh, and, uh, and joy and praying 
after having been beaten and chained uh, with hopeless prisoners, uh, it gave him uh, uh, the uh, leverage, if you will, to speak to these prisoners about eternal life. And we know some of them must have come to eternal life be, by their behavior. Uh, and then not running away during that earthquake. It, it opened up an opportunity of doing what's right, and as a result, uh, gave him an opportunity to speak to the, the jailer and obviously the jailer's family. But all these things are just examples of finding common ground with people. And uh, I would say for you and I as well, to, uh, to witness effectively, we must find a common ground with folks that enables us to share just beyond uh, greetings and, and to go to deeper things. We must have some avenue into people's lives that allows us to go to that level of sharing Christ. Another uh, thing I want us to note here is Paul's strategy for planting the gospel. And I want to just remind us that he passed up two cities in order to get to Thessalonica. Thessalonica is 100 miles southwest of Philippi. It took a while to get there. And he had to go through these other cities. And and basically, Amphipolis was a larger city than Philippi. And so uh, as as we just sort of consider that, this this is an interesting thing because uh, I would assume that there must have been some guidance by the Holy Spirit, or certainly much prayer and thought behind the strategy of going past uh, a couple of cities to get to a larger city, the the capital of Macedonia, which was Thessalonica. In fact, if I had been a new convert in Philippi, and if I had relatives living in one of those other two cities, I would have sent my pigeon to send a message to the next town to try to, you know, get there ahead of Paul and his team to say, guess what, Uh, Paul and Silas and Timothy were here in Philippi, and uh, we heard them speak this thing called the gospel, and our lives have been changed, and we we desperately want you to hear that truth. And I would would certainly be trying to contact someone there that I knew. And so if I had heard that, well, he bypassed those two cities. He didn't stop and share Jesus with anyone there. That would have been mortifying in my own heart and soul about my own relatives. So the question comes to, you know, why would we uh, find uh, Paul who's, you know, who's trying to obey the Great Commission, who, uh, you know, himself cares about unsaved people to walk past two cities to get to another city? That, that, that might not go over well with certain people. And it tells me something just to remind myself about even our own church on how we choose or how we decide to Uh, determine where God wants us to effectively uh, plant the gospel somewhere else. And if if God wants us to plant a church perhaps somewhere down the road, uh, where would that be and how would we know where we should go and would we pass up communities to plant a church somewhere else? It tells us that these things are, uh, are obviously larger decisions than any of one of us could ever make. And so we cannot, uh, any one of us, uh, we know we can't reach everyone. I, I can't reach everyone, neither can you. I know that when Jesus walked this earth, he could not reach everyone. Can you imagine the uh, disappointment if somebody missed him? If somebody had a, a, a family member who was, who was uh, uh, maybe crippled or had some other disease and they were trying to get there in time and they missed him. And so, obviously, uh, we have to realize that we need the mind of God to help us in the strategy of just, you know, how to spread the gospel and where to spread the gospel, and that's so absolutely necessary. Just some things I wanted to observe here. So let's get back to our text, and we know that in in verse 4 of Acts 17, we said some of them, that means the Jewish ones in the uh, synagogue, were persuaded by what Paul had to say. And this is, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So there was a, a, a great movement here of God working. And yet, you know, Luke doesn't give us uh, an in-depth description of what takes place. This is a very brief statement. It, it's almost downplayed. But if we didn't read a great multitude here, that, that expression, we would, we would wonder if anyone actually responded. 
So let me just step out of this and go to what Nick was reading uh, uh, just a bit ago from 1 Thessalonians. And just to remind us again uh, of what was read and just the expressions that's given here. I'm going to start in verse 5 of chapter 1 and uh, listen to what he says. For our gospel did not come to you. He's speaking about the Thessalonian believers. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. And that's something that we all uh, long to see happen, that when we share Christ Jesus and the message of the gospel with anyone else, we, uh, we don't want it to be just our words. We don't want it to just be a word given. Uh, the, the, the very idea of that, of that phrase is the idea that it's just words that drop out of the air and, and really have no impact. So uh, it, it just says here that we... Uh, uh, our words came in power and in the Holy Spirit. Obviously, the Spirit is the one who gives the power to the Word of God. And in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, and, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the Word in much affliction. We, we uh, are reminded here and uh, also in other places that those who came out of Macedonia, uh, those believers who were in Macedonia were persecuted for their faith. Uh, many of them had lost properties and lost uh, you know, uh, any significance or importance in the culture. Uh, they were uh, looked at as very poor believers. The, the church was impoverished. Uh, it, it was part of the uh, package of following Jesus in this place. It was not easy. And he says, but yet you, re you receive this word in much affliction, but it says, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia. Let me stop. Let's just remember, we just went through two cities where we did not share the gospel. So as Paul made the decision to go past Amphipolis and uh, Apollonia, uh, guess what? The gospel still went right back to those places after he presented it here in Thessalonica. And that is an amazing thing. It's as though, you know, God knows exactly where his word should go, and he knows how his word will get there. And it may be through you and I, or it may be through someone else. And it doesn't always have to be just, you know, the one in, who's preaching or the one who's uh, maybe the, the chief evangelist in the church. It, it can be someone else. And God knows how to use all of us to get his word out to the right places at the right time. It goes on and says, For from you the word has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia, but he adds here, and Achaia. Now that's all the southern part. That's, that's you know, what we call Greece today, uh, where you have you know, obviously the city of Athens. We'll see that next time. And then you have the, a larger city, Corinth, that's down south yet. And so the word of God from this one crowd has spread back, and also from the north city of Philippi. And so you have these uh, small uh, town of Philippi down to the large city of, uh, of Thessalonica, and the gospel has reached all of Macedonia and all of Achaia. And then he adds here, but also in every place. I don't know what that means, except every town and hamlet has somehow heard something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says here, for your faith toward God has gone out. And then this next phrase is, is really crazy. Listen, so that we do not need to say anything. He's saying, you have so covered the area uh, that in some, on some level, we, we, re, we don't need to follow up with this. Now, we know he's going to go to Athens in, in the next story and to Corinth as well. But the point is simply that this crowd has done an amazing job of getting the word out to so many people that need to hear the gospel. And God knew ahead of time exactly what he was doing and how to accomplish the goal. So if Macedonians who've never seen Jesus and who've uh, never met him or, or the Christ, if they have so fallen in love with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the person of Christ so that they have witnessed to such an impact around them. What does that say as a testimony to our church today? Really in the same position. We haven't seen Christ like them. We only hear the story through God's written word. 
uh, and we have this response of, of and, and responsibility actually of taking this truth and declaring it to others. And it's not something that, you know, we want to twist arms to do. It's something that should come naturally flowing out of hearts that love Jesus Christ. When I thought about this uh, series called Mission 2020, I had that in my own mind about my own self, but also for our church, that God would use us this year in such a uh, perhaps more dramatic, dynamic way as we all just capture the the heartbeat of this, of this text, the story in the book of Acts of caring about sharing the word of God with other people. I hope that the heartbeat of this, these Macedonian people, the, those especially from this uh, town of Thessalonica would impact us to such a degree to see that happen. So the effect of the gospel I wanted to share in four ways, and I just uh, shared basically the first part of that, which is the gospel reached its goal. It, it has spread to everyone in every way, in so many ways, and so uh, that's, that's critically important for us. Uh, there's also just another secondary lesson for us as a church, which is simply that if, we, if you put too much emphasis uh, and effort and finances in the wrong decisions about where to plant the gospel, uh, that would have uh, not near the impact as if the Holy Spirit leads us and we're following his lead on how to do that. So God help us that we would hear the Holy Spirit speak to us. So the effect of the gospel in four ways, the first one is the gospel reached its goal. Second, the effect of the gospel is this, that the gospel stirred reaction. And we see that in verses 5 through 8 of our, of our text here, uh, in Acts 17, it says, But the Jews who were, who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out, that is, Paul and his team, out to the people. But when they had, did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Uh, he goes on, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king named Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So uh, this is uh, you know, a, a challenging uh, moment that's taking place, that uh, this message that has turn the world upside down, turn this whole area upside down. We just talked about the saturation of the gospel. Uh, but obviously they're keying on this idea that there's another king. There's another king named Jesus, and that's the way of expressing, obviously, to, to Rome and certainly to Caesar that there's competition and you need to do something. So the crowd is worried that you know, Rome will come in and, and deal with this city if they thought this was coming from the city itself. If this is allowed, it's going to create a, a huge tension between uh, Thessalonica and Rome. So yes, the crowd is certainly concerned. I want to just back up to uh, what is said here because it says that uh, what, what initiated this mob was this idea of becoming envious. This uh, Jewish crowd is recognizing the, the impact of this message of the gospel. It's affecting and changing people's lives. And so there's this rising up internal thing of envy and, and, uh, it, and those who have influence uh, are causing this crowd to, uh, to move against the believers. And when you take envy and you take influence and you mix them together, that becomes a, a dangerous ingredient that uh, can work against uh, those of us who are of the faith, especially against the good effects of the gospel. Let me uh, remind uh, some of you, you might know this, but a few years ago, a certain pastor in our area, his daughter had come home and said, I've asked Jesus Christ into my life. And, uh, of course, she made this decision at an after-school program. And he was livid with this. He was angry, and he responded back to those leaders, Do, my daughter does not need to be saved. And uh, that was certainly a, a tough thing to hear, and obviously he has some influence over 
the school and the programs that take place. And, you know, whether it was envy or embarrassment, I don't know for sure, but the influence of, of such a person in a small community, you know, may likely have held back others, certainly uh, spiritually blinding others, having been in such an influential position, so that perhaps those in his own church have not heard or did not hear the gospel themselves from this pastor because of his own attitudes. It's not unusual, by the way. I've heard this from my friends uh, uh, Meshed. I've heard this from uh, uh, in other areas as well. That where a gospel preaching church is being established, sometimes near a community that's you know either uh, mostly Buddhist or Hindu or perhaps even Muslim, you know that often will stir up jealousy, and it's not unusual that suddenly there will be an influential. Uh, press against the church by some that causes much trouble. That, that's something that takes place. It's a common story around uh, many places and also even here in our little world. Uh, Peter mentions uh, in his first letter in chapter 4 and verse 12 uh, that we should not be surprised by fiery trials uh, in uh, verse 13, he goes on in that passage and says, but we should rejoice if, if we partake of Christ's sufferings. And so I just want to remind all of us that, yes, yeah, sometimes uh, the gospel comes in, in, and, and there will be a reaction. There will be a, a stirring of people that are resentful of, of someone else's life being changed, a husband or a wife, perhaps one of their spouses has their life changed, and that impacts their whole uh, their whole relationship and their whole house, and sometimes that's not well received. Then there's the effect of the gospel that that the gospel comes with a cost. And so we read here in the text in verse nine. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Uh, so obviously his house was attacked. Uh, Jason, we know little about him at all, but uh, he and others, it says some brethren, we don't know who's there with him, uh, they took them uh, and by force took them to the rulers. And it says they took security. I, I assume that means they took collateral. Uh, they uh, perhaps took bail uh, to let them back out, or they took property deeds from them. Uh, they, they took something that would create leverage you know, you, you, uh, you continue doing this behavior, we can leverage this against you. There, there was some kind of threat there that, uh, that they took security. Uh, obviously, I want to say this, belonging to a community of believers, uh, it makes us, us viewed by the world as, as being one or, or you know, being uh, uh, strongly unified. A and it should. Uh, you know, obviously that we want people to recognize that we are committed together. So, you know, when you join this church, uh, you need to know that uh, we understand that in joining us, in, in pledging your allegiance to Christ and to his church, uh, it is certainly uh, uh, putting a mark on you in some way that someone else will know. Others may, uh, you know, not like the fact that you've done that. Here's the thing, as the gospel spreads its life-changing impact, there will be resistance, and sometimes that resistance will boil over into persecution. There's risk, to some degree, to those who follow Jesus and who join with fellow believers. There's the risk of being rejected. There's the risk of being despised by someone. There's the risk of loss. You know, that, that loss might be uh, things like, you know, friendships. It might be relatives. The, the loss might be in, uh, in work issues. It might be uh, opportunities that you may or may not now have. It might be the loss of reputation. Uh, it might be the loss of certain freedoms. Uh, you know, just uh, uh, go back and think about the example we're looking at here at Jason's house. Yes, there was a financial issue here, but way more than that. There was public scandal. There was uh, public uh, suspicion. Uh, there was public separation. And more than six feet, by the way. Th this was uh, a serious uh, thing in terms of 
what it's now costing his own home and his household, his family and friends that stayed there. Uh, that this is what sometimes the gospel can do. And we might think, well, I don't want that to happen to me. But obviously, these folks are so uh, in love with Christ, they're not concerned about that. We who are followers of Jesus Christ may at some point in our journey have to make a decision, which is this. Is he worthy in terms of the personal cost that might come to us? It, it, it's easy in this community, it's easy in Sugar Creek to, to say, I love Jesus Christ and I'm going to follow him. We have companies, we have organizations, we have uh, you know, multiple churches here that, and people who will claim that they follow and love Jesus Christ. This community is blessed in, the, in many ways by that, and I'm thankful I live here. I'm thankful we have a church here. And some of you drive from other communities where that's not true. And in fact, that, that giving your life to Christ and pledging yourself to his people to join with us in this you know, unified uh, follow, fellowship of Jesus, it has its pressures that can come from different places. And some of you have maybe experienced that, and I just want to remind us, is he worthy? Is he worthy of the cost that might come to us? And I want to say today, absolutely he is worthy, isn't he? He must be. What he's done for us uh, puts him at the top of the list of being worthy. Now, in order to avoid such reaction, and I'm not talking about our text right now, but just the reality of this, that there are many who attempt to popularize Christianity, uh, to uh, communicate our benefit to the culture. Some are into that. Uh, promoting famous athletes, famous musicians, famous artists, uh, somehow to say, these folks are converted, that makes us okay. Uh, there are some who preach positive and affirming messages that promote the well-being of fellow citizens uh, to basically say to our communities, hey, we're harmless. You know, we're we're, uh, we're non-threatening. We're, we're uh, intentionally uh, uh, attempting to be good neighbors. Uh, there are some who want Christianity to say that, you know, we're appealing and we're attractive and we're welcoming to all. And yes, we are welcoming to all, but... All these things are, 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 are wrong attempts to promote what it is that we follow, which is the gospel of Jesus. And if we're honest, our message is narrow. In fact, uh, I don't think that it can help but stir reaction. It will definitely uh, lead to personal cost for many, especially, especially as soon as we announce this. There is only one way, there's only one truth, there's only one life, and it only comes through Jesus Christ. As soon as we say that, uh, we find ourselves isolated from others. Uh, Jesus pointed this out in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, when he made the statement, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. In other words, the common flow of, of people in this world is going through a wide gate of convenience. And there are some who are uh, promoting Christianity as this convenient, easy access avenue of following Jesus and trying to popularize that idea. And that's so counter to what our Lord himself has told us. Let's remind ourselves that is he worthy? Is he worthy of any cost? And absolutely, dear friends, he is worthy, I'm telling you. The, the fourth effect of the gospel is this. The gospel is the reward of the seeker. Look at verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So they're leaving the city now, heading to Berea, another town here. And it says, when they arrived... They went into the synagogue of the Jews. Here we go again, same pattern. And uh, it says here, and this is very unique, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they, they've gone into this uh, next town, uh, 
uh, slid away, got here, and uh, do the same routine, go to the synagogue that's there. And this description is so uh, wonderfully refreshing and unusual. They received the word with all readiness. Uh, the idea of being fair-minded simply means that they're, they're kind, they're, uh, they're, they're willing listeners. Uh, they're not resistant or uh, uh, you know, trying to put walls up that here's someone coming to tell us something because they're more important than we are or have a better message than what we already believe in. They're, they're very open. They're receiving the word with all readiness. It's a great compliment uh, to uh, these Jewish followers and so on. It says they, they search the scriptures daily to, to, to verify what they were hearing. And that's, that's fair. That's, that's, that's a compliment. Uh, I know in our church, uh, one of the distinguishing features of our people of Alpine, which I'm so proud of, is that you are people of the Word of God. No one's going to come in here and teach and preach and get away with something that's different uh, or contradictory to that which we already are called to believe. And each of us has a, uh, the Word of God, and we each are using the Word of God as an instrument in our life. So uh, that can't happen. And so I'm thrilled about that. May that continue. That's why we promote and raise the Word of God as so chief, center, Jesus Christ, to know Him and to make Him known. So we want that to happen. So many Jews believe. Verse 12 tells us then, Therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. It's an interesting little phrase, again, that we're reminded twice now. We've been reminded of this in two different places. So there's something about this that I think is worthy of just highlighting for a moment. It's an unusual thing for uh, anyone to come in contact in a church, come in contact with uh, a balanced cultural uh, uh, community uh, that is uh, balanced between poor and prominent, between uh, uh, you know, the wealthy and those who are not, between the elite and I'm not saying that in a prideful way, just those who have maybe more education to those who have less education. It's, it's unusual to find a crowd that's balanced in a sense of humility and, and uh, love and care for one another without you know, sort of promoting oneself and one's position. That's an unusual thing. And this, this is highlighted here for us for a very important reason. This emphasis is a reminder to all of us of God's grace extended to everyone. And uh, obviously, to receive God's grace, there has to be a spirit of humility in every person, whether prominent or, or less prominent, to become recipients of that grace. And again, if I could continue back from what the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, at verse 14, the next verse, he's talking about uh, many who go in by this wide gate. Then he says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And the whole point is, yes, there are few who find it. And the reason there are few to find it is because usually of pride, uh, of you know, not uh, listening for truth, not seeking truth, uh, not uh, uh, allowing truth to be something that is humbly uh, uh, taken into the heart and thought through. And so as long as we uh, think that we know more than someone else or we uh, don't want someone else to tell us how to think or how to believe, if we have that approach, then we're going to be on that wide path and we're going to miss this narrow path that leads to life. And that's why so few find it. And this crowd is an open crowd, listening, curious, wanting to hear, checking it out, and that's very commendable, commendable for them. So the, this is the result. This, the, the wonderful results here in Berea are the result of honest and diligent uh, uh, responses to ask questions, to seek answers from the one and only source of truth, which is God's Word. And so their reward, here's the thing, their reward and our reward when we humbly receive the truth of the gospel is that we find ourselves then placed on, solid, on the solid rock. We find ourselves with a sure foundation. We find ourselves with a faith that is finally firm. I always uh, refer to people who are seeking and searching for truth. 
uh, these uh, believers at uh, Berea obviously were prepared to hear because they were truly wanting to hear something beyond what they already knew. They, they were not uh, followers of, uh, of, of God in the sense of, of Judaism uh, and assuming that that was the answer. Uh, they, they were looking for that which would connect the dots of, uh, of what they knew about the Old Testament and what still was missing in their own lives. They knew they were falling short of, of God's law. They knew they couldn't measure up, and they were seeking and listening and yearning to hear that. And then here comes the one who helps them understand that uh, the one I, who I, I preach about is Jesus. He's this Messiah. And as, as uh, in every synagogue, when believers heard that uh, and, and were listening believers who were wanting to hear the truth, it made such an impact in their life, and especially all the all those who were uh, Greek and all those who were uh, connected to this crowd, and it says they're even the prominent ones, both men and women, obviously all finding that the vacuum in their life has finally been filled with truth. It's in Jesus Christ. There's someone, there's someone, I'm telling you, in your life, there's someone in my life that needs to hear the gospel, and as I ask the Holy Spirit, to, to guide my steps, to, to ordain my steps, to lead me to that person, to that conversation, to an opportunity uh, to share the gospel, praying for an open door of opportunity. As the Lord leads us, we carry with us the completion, the answer to someone who's probably already seeking for the truth. It seems as though that's how God leads us. And he leads us into the path of seekers, and seekers are people who have already been primed by the Holy Spirit to be seeking. Because no one, no one looks for truth on their own. You go back to Romans chapter 3. We're dead outside of Christ. We're not looking for him outside of him. But we are seeking for answers, many of us. And that, that truth itself is that which God has already implanted in us. So as uh, we go back on this journey, let me just recap this thing. The, the gospel will reach its goal. I'm reminded of that. Uh, so when I sit and worry about, well, what about all the people in another nation somewhere who've never heard the gospel, and I, I throw that out as some sort of criticism of Christianity, i got to come back and say, God never misses anyone. That's a truth that has to sink in our heads. If I don't follow through and witness when he calls me to do so, he will take care of who he's calling to himself. I want to make that clear. Because sometimes we can live on a guilt trip that, well, I, I, I didn't make that phone call. I didn't send that note. I didn't uh, get into a conversation or I didn't go to the level I could have in that conversation. Now, shame on me. And uh, I want you to know that God will still get his word out to whoever he, he has appointed to hear his word. It's going to take place whether I am responsive or not, whether our church is responsive or not. The gospel will reach its goal. So all those folks in Apollonia, Amphipolis, they heard the word. Paul knew exactly where he was supposed to go. God blessed that whole decision and took care of what was behind the path that, uh, that we might have thought was missed. Second thing is this. The gospel always stirs reaction. Let us remind us of that. It presses against the conscience it causes people to uh, repel oftentimes, uh, get upset, get angry, get frustrated. It either attracts people to Christ or the gospel offends people against Christ. And we just have to know that. That's what happens. The gospel then also comes with a cost. It may bring resistance. It may bring persecution. But what Jesus did for each of us makes him worthy of following. It makes him worthy of speaking out. It makes him worthy of our testifying of what he's done in our personal lives. He is worthy, isn't he? And then finally, the gospel always rewards the seeker. What did Jesus say? Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. It, to know Christ Jesus and to receive his gift of eternal life is the greatest thing that
that can ever happen. It's happened to me. It's happened to most of you. Uh, but there may be some listening right now, and yet that has not happened. Or maybe right now you're just in a position of wondering if this can be something to be in your life. And I want to remind you that as the gospel has been presented, there is always an invitation to repent to Jesus Christ of your sin, to invite him to be your savior and your Lord, your master, to, to live in your life, uh, to, uh, to provide for you that blessing of the, of the gift of eternal life as you've placed faith and trust in Jesus. And you can do that. There are no perfect words. It really comes out of your heart of faith. Believing and you will receive. And I uh, call on you to do that right now. May that be your heart's decision. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus watching this right now, I ask that you would just, again, renew in your own heart that, that sense of his worthiness and uh, recognize the opportunities that are, are all around us that God brings and and if not, you know what? Just pray a prayer and say, Lord, please ordain my steps. Please guide me into a conversation that I need to have with certain people and show me in my heart who those people should be. And I'm telling you, he will give you names in your heart and mind that will pop up in your life or somehow through this week or next week, he'll reveal in a circumstance uh, who you should be sharing the gospel with. And uh, make no mistake, when you do that, God will bless that and God will honor your decision to follow him and obey him uh, because, not because you have to, it's because we love him and want to declare his truth. And I pray that'll be in your heart this week. This is a tough time. Uh, stay faithful. Stay in God's word. Uh, we want to meet with you again on Wednesday as Nick leads us. Uh, may you find in your heart uh, just a burning passion to be uh, Christ Jesus and represent him to all those around who know you, especially your family right now, even others. Uh, may God direct you this week, I pray in Christ's name. Lord, as we uh, uh, just bring this message to you today and in, in, in uh, response to your own work in my own heart, I ask that you'll use these words and this story, uh, a true story, a factual event, uh, and how lives have been so affected, how... Uh, an entire nation had been affected by the witness of people. Uh, they fell in love with you, and they could not cease to declare who you were. It changed their life, and it so changed their life that others around recognized that something new and fresh and unique had happened, and obviously the, the word about Jesus Christ and your gospel spread all over the place. Lord, help us to be faithful here. Uh, we're so accustomed to these words. We're so accustomed to stories from the Bible. We're so accustomed to phrases about witnessing and, and even using the term the gospel. Help us to uh, truly understand the, uh, the, the depth of what it means to know you and have a passion in our hearts that's fired up by your spirit to speak your word to others. And I ask that you will have words that fall on people's hearts, words that have power, words that are uh, stirred by your Holy Spirit into the hearts and lives of people. So we ask your blessing on the days ahead and what you're going to do. Uh, help us to be uh, just more committed followers of you. And I ask even now that people would be yearning to join this church, to connect with us even right now when we feel so disconnected because of who you are. We are connected through Christ, and we give you all the praise and all the glory, lifting Jesus in this place. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you Wednesday.